All right, I am back with another video, and today is the ever highly anticipated, surely it probably is, a 1,000 subscriber special. I'm totally not late to this by like nearly 700 extra subscribers, but I figured, but it was only because I was bouncing back and forth on like, you know, what I actually wanted to do, and I thought, you know what, I'm just going to do the simplest thing I can think of. I'm going to show you all today how I actually make these videos. Not necessarily the whole technical editing and YouTube side of things, but more just how do I go about actually making these builds? What's the thought process? How do I do my research? How do I do my testing? And how do I get the footage overall? So basically the way this is going to work is I'm actually going to show you where I get my information from, that being the wiki, how I start off a build idea, so in this case finding a sort of concept or, f or mechanic to build around, and then just kind of go through the processes step by step. This is going to be totally off the cusp, none of this is pre-recorded, this is going to show my raw kind of editing, not really editing, but like kind of theory crafting process, there will be some light edits here and there, but I'm going to try and keep this mostly raw, so you can see exactly what I'm going for, I just, I, I chuckle, because I, every time I say raw, I just hear Gordon Ramsay in the back of my head just shouting raw, and I, it makes me laugh, uh, anyways, so, I'm actually going to be making a build today right in front of you guys, and I'm actually going to, um, and by the end of this video, we we will have a complete build, I would hope. Uh, but this is going to show you kind of the whole process that I go through of how I make these builds. I've probably said that like five times by now, but you get the point, so let's just get into it. Oh, again, one more thing. See, this is why I should have, <laughs> I should really write scripts, but I don't. Um... The other half of this video, because I don't just want to be like, okay, this is how you make a build, goodbye. I actually want to show you the forbidden builds. Essentially builds that would use cut content from the game. So, the reason I don't really use mods to make videos such as modded subclasses or, cut, or like modded in items, like cut content and such, is because I want these builds to be accessible to console players. And unfortunately this whole video, while for the most part is going to be good for console players, because it's just like this is how you could theorycraft a build. Uh, the thing is, is on PC I actually get to test these builds right away, whereas on console you'd have to play through the whole game just to see if it even works, which really does suck for a lot of people. Um, but, however, I feel like this is going to be a good showcase for people who don't really make builds for video games or haven't really played D&D or Baldur's Gate 3 before. I want to kind of know how to make builds. So this is kind of what I'm going to do uh, today. So the first thing is going to be, so like I said, the first half of this video is going to be me, me showing you how I make builds. And the second half of this video is me going to be showing off a cut, cut content weapons and items that I don't use in my builds but would like to present to you guys, so for those of you who can use them in your games through mods, through whatever, um, can actually make builds based on that. And I'll give some like, quick, like, off the, off the cusp uh, theory crafting ideas for builds using those items. Uh, but I've rambled on long enough, this intro is way too long, I'll have to put like a chapter thing in the video to just be like, hey, this is where I actually start. <laughs> But this is like a subscriber special thing, this isn't my standard video, you know what I mean. Uh, but anyways, let's get into it. So, as you can see right in front of me, I have the feet page. Now, the now the, usually sometimes with, with these builds, uh, I either start with like a build request or a character idea or something like that. But today I'm starting with a mechanic. So I was scrolling through the wiki and I saw the spell Sniper Feet. And immediately it stands out to me. You learn a cantrip. And the number you need to roll a critical hit while attacking with a spell is reduced by one, this effect can stack. Now, we all know about crit fishing and crit, crit chance stacking and all that sort of thing. But I thought it could still be a really interesting basis for a character. Uh, so you actually do get to learn an extra cantrip, which, just, which does show the cantrip that I think would work best for this strategy. The obvious being Eldritch Blast, we'll have a look at that in a minute. But since we're probably going to be getting Eldritch Blast before this point, we could actually choose another cantrip from this list. And I would say Shocking Grasp or Fawn Whip would probably be good. Uh, Shocking Grasp, simply for the fact that you would have a melee option if that ever came up. But also Thorn Whip is just a fun spell that you don't really get in many other situations unless you pretty much purely go Druid. But something like Firebolt, Rare Frost or Bone Shield could also work. But I might grab one of those bottom two just to be fun again. Maybe that will come up when we actually make the character, as in the identity of the person we're going to be playing as. Uh, these cantrips use your character's ability score and modifier. For example, if a cleric chose Eldritch Blast with this feat, they would use their wisdom modifier and not their charisma. That is a really cool and 
interesting feature of this feat, meaning that you have a lot more freedom with what these cantrips actually would be able to do. However, in the case of Eldritch Blast, I think we're still going to want to stick with Charisma, because again, we'll want to grab Eldritch Blast as early as possible. That means going Warlock. And of course, all the things that would boost Eldritch Blast would also work with Warlock as well, so you want that Charisma high. So we're not going to be too creative there. But that immediately gives us a goal to strive towards, that being our first feat, uh, our main method of attack, that being Eldritch Blast, our first class, that being Warlock, so the build is already starting to come together. And immediately with the name like Spell Sniper, you can automatically think of where this build will actually go as well. So again, while we could just stack on uh, critical hit boosting chances, which is probably what I'm going to do, I might also actually see if we can be a Spell Sniper, someone who is able to fire these Eldritch Blasts from really, really far away. Essentially allowing you to have a bit of battlefield control, forcing your enemies to come towards you while you pick them off with Eldritch Blasts from as far of a distance as you can. That sounds like a really, really interesting build concept already, and I can already see the character being built from that. This person, perhaps, uh, took on a Warlocked Pact. Maybe they, like Karlak, were a fighter in the Walls of Avernus, in which they were one of the greatest snipers known to man, able to shoot an Eldritch Blast from hundreds and hundreds of feet away. And maybe that's the whole point of the character. They are this stoic, cold, like, hell like nine hells version of american sniper or something i don't freaking know i've never seen that film but you know avernus sniper there you go that's the name of the build the avernus sniper i love it that's how a character and a build comes together that's and it's just from one feat so we have our spell sniper feat feet. Obviously, unfortunately, this means we, our build isn't really going to start to come online majorly until level 4, but that's still Act 1, so that's not so bad, and we can still get a lot of the features that we want from this build before that point anyway. So, let's look at Eldritch Blast. I mean, we all know what Eldritch Blast does. Conjure a beam of crackling energy, dealing 1d10 force damage to a target, and the higher levels you get, the more beams you get. So, at the end of the day, at level 10, you're going to be doing 3d10 force damage to one enemy or across three. Pretty good. Not not a bad cantrip at all, I mean it's very much well known as one of the best cantrips in the game, but it obviously scales better when you go with the Warlock. So if we open up the Warlock page here, let's drag that over, this is kind of how I organise all my tabs. Uh, we need to, we actually get to look at the Warlock features, obviously we can pick up Eldritch Blast straight away, and then another useful cantrip like Friends, which I really like, so it's worth grabbing both of these. Uh, then, obviously, I can look at the first level spells and be like, oh yeah, Armor of Agathis for a bit more tankiness, Hex to get additional damage off, although again, because we're going to be firing from so far away, getting other spells off that aren't like projectiles, it might be a bit tricky. So you kind of have to think about what you want to prioritize there. I can absolutely see Armor of Agathis and maybe Hex if you're not able to get away quick enough, if you want that little bit of extra damage. Hellish Rebuke to be able to retaliate, but I'm not exactly sure what the range is on Hellish Rebuke. Well, we can have a look. Uh, there doesn't appear to be a range listed on the wiki. So until we actually test this, I can assume that if someone is able to hit you with a spell, you can hit them back. So that makes sense. So we'll have Hellish Rebuke and probably Armor of Agathis for a bit more tankiness with the cantrips, friends, and Eldritch Blast. There you go, that's your base level 1 kit sorted. But then we also have the subclass. And of course when you think, okay, if this is going to be a crit fishing build, then there's one subclass for it out of Warlock that we're going to get a lot of use out of throughout the whole game, and that would be Great Old One, because we would get the Mortal Reminder feature. When you land a, crit land a critical hit against a creature, that creature and any nearby enemies must succeed a Wisdom Saving Throw or become frightened. And frightened means that those people cannot move, and frightened entities also have disadvantage on ability checks and attack rolls. So... You land your super easy crit with our higher chance to crit, then all those enemies that would normally have to move towards you to be able to hit you, lose a turn of being able to do that. So all of a sudden you have a massive advantage in being able to continuously snipe enemies that can't move against you. Pretty cool. Again, not foolproof, but I think it works. So, over, so now in just one level, we have quite a decent goal to strive towards and a decent gameplay strategy. Then obviously because we're running Eldritch Blast, we want to go to level two of Warlock for the Eldritch Invocations. What this is essentially going to do for us is going to get us Agonizing Blast, allowing us to add our Charisma modifier to the damage it deals. Uh, and then also, do, 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 where is it? Repelling Blast, if I knew my... There we go. Repelling Blast means you can also push a creature. So if one of those creatures that you're sniping happens to be near a ledge, 
boom, they're gone. But also Repelling Blast would allow you to push creatures away from you anyway, making it even harder for them to reach you. This is a this is now turned into a battlefield control build as well as a high damage build. So overall, you're getting a lot out of this already. This seems like a fun build to go with. And again, I'm, I may seem like I know what I'm talking about here, but I'm coming up with all this shit on the spot just from general game knowledge. For someone who doesn't really know D&D or Baldur's Gate 3 or anything like that that well, they're not going to be able to come to these conclusions as quickly, but this is just kind of the thought process. Just do your research. Now, then you have to ask yourself, do we actually get anything from going level 3 of Warlock? And my first glance says, maybe? You'd get level 2 spell slots, which means that if we're going to do something that I'm, that I'm kind of thinking of in a minute, we might want those level 2 spell slots in the end. But seeing as we're going to be a ranged caster, I don't see Pact of the Blade doing us too much good. Pact of the Tome maybe, if you want Guidance of Vicious Mockery, but again, we're pretty much always going to be casting Eldritch Blast with our action. So I don't really see the point of this here. I can maybe see going to level 3 of Warlock for Misty Step, Mirror Image. Again, Misty Step will give you a lot of maneuverability. If an enemy does get too close, you can quickly get yourself into position away from them to start the whole process again. And you would also gain Detect Thoughts and Phantasmal Thoughts. Phantasmal Force from the Great Old One. And again, you could keep going into Warlock, but I actually think level 2 or 3 is high enough. Probably level 2 at the base minimum because you just want those Eldritch Invocations. Level 3 if maybe you want to go Pact of the Tome for those extra cantrips, or Pact of the Chain maybe if you want to have a familiar that can take the heat off you so you can get away. That could also work. And possibly also grabbing Misty Step as well and those improved Warlock spell slots. But again, we can come back to this later. Because now I'm thinking, okay, so we've got our main damage cantrip done. We have got Eldritch Blast and the invocations to bust it, boost it up, plus the Mortal Reminder feature to make it even more powerful when we get those crits, which again, for us, should be easier to land. So, what multi-class would work with this build? Well, if we go back to the idea of being a spell sniper, well then there's really only one thing for it. We want to go for Sorcerer particularly for the meta magic options here. So with Sorcerer, you get, obviously people are going to know this, but I'll just say it for the sake of um, information. Uh, when you play a Sorcerer, once you reach level two, you get the thing called meta magic. And that lets you spend a unique resource called Sorcery Points to augment your spells. And the one we're specifically looking at here is Extended Spell. Double the, oh no, not, sorry, Distant Spell, see? Increases the range of spells by 50%. Spells with a range of 1.5 meters, for example, are increased to uh, 9 meters. Damn, that's pretty cool. So that means now we are able to fire our Eldritch Blast from even further away for the cost of sorcery points. Now, this is where the classic combination comes in. If you're a DD vet, you know this the Saw Lock. Uh, basically, the Sorcerer Warlock Multiclass has a very, very unique interaction where because you are spending these sorcery points as part of your main uh, casting feature, with a build like this, if you're wanting to stay really, really far away from enemies, uh, like, and I mean really far away, you're going to be spending up a, spending a lot of your sorcery points. Now, Distance Spell only costs, if we look again, one sorcery point, which we get two right off the bat, which is pretty good. But I could see us going most of the way in Sorcery here to get as many sorcery points as possible to be able to use this strategy a lot. But then the Sawlock combo comes in, because with your meta magic, you can actually trade spell slots for sorcery points and vice versa. So with create sorcery points, which I think is what we want, want to be doing more, you spend spell slots to gain sorcery points. The level of the spell slot spent creates the equivalent number in sorcery points. So if we then decide, okay, maybe then we do go to Warlock level 3 to get those level, uh, level 2 spell slots, that means that we can create, if I'm reading this correctly, again, I haven't actually used this strategy really in the game. Uh, the level of spell slots spent. Yeah, so you would be able to create, if you had level 2 spell slots, and two of those level 2 spell slots, because of we're a warlock, that each recover on a short rest, you're getting an extra four sorcery points every short rest. Which basically means this strategy is going to be constantly online. So I would actually say, okay, I think it's actually worth going to level 3 and warlock now. That kind of wishy-washy thing we were about before now makes sense to actually go that far. So I would say now that that also means it's worth going to level four to grab that extra feat and also an extra cantrip and all that other good stuff. So now we're just getting, so now we know that our main probably kind of highest level we want to go in Warlock is four. If you wanted to turn this into a Gish type build, then you could go to level five or Pact of the Blade to get extra attack. 
Um, but I, or even if you wanted to get back to the tome for haste to be able to go absolutely mental on the um, on the Eldritch Blast, you could. However, I feel like level four is a good capstone for now. If we're wanting to put a lot of um, our resources into um, Sorcerer to be able to get as many sorcery points as we can. So let's look into what Sorcerer is going to give us then. So now we've decided we're going to go Sorcerer for the metamatic, meta magic option. So that's going to give us regular spell slots as well, which is good. Uh, we're going to get some more cantrips, which is good, and some more spells. But of course, the cool thing about going with multi with multi-class in casters like this means we get to pick up some utility options. Again, we have our main damage option in Eldritch Blast, which is what we're going to be wanting to be casting 90% of the time. So that's when we can pick up the utility options like Disguise Self, Enhanced Leap, Featherfall, and Shield. Shield probably being our number one option here, and maybe even Magic Missile as well. If for some reason we can't fire that Eldritch Blast around a corner, there's something in our way, then Magic Missile can do the job instead. And, it, and obviously Magic Missile is just a bread and butter skill. It scales up really nicely. But then we have also, because of because we're going with Sorcerer, we get to choose our subclass at level 1 as well. And then we have a few options. I would immediately rule out Wild Magic, just because when we're casting Eldritch Blast so, so, so much, we don't really want to incur that risk of our strategy suddenly going awry for some reason. So, maybe on a more goofy build or something that's a bit less serious, you could go with Wild Magic. Or, I mean, there is a slight bonus to it, getting advantage on attack rolls. Getting advantage on that Eldritch Blast would also give you a higher chance to crit. But we'll leave that behind for now. Draconic Bloodline does kind of work. If you're going to take most of your levels in Sorcerer, that extra hit point boost would be nice, as well as the unarmored defense. But I could also see Storm Sorcery here, because getting that Tempestuous Magic fe feature would allow you to fly away. However, that only comes when you cast a level 1 spell. And if your main focus is Aldrich Blast, and if you wanted to move, you'd better you'd be better off just going for Misty Step rather than having to cast maybe like some random level one or higher spell just to be able to fly a little bit further. So Storm, Storm Sorcery, especially when we're already at a high enough level with level four of Warlock, where we would have Misty Step already, doesn't really feel like that it's that useful. So I think Draconic Bloodline does kind of work a bit better here overall, in my opinion. Again, this is just a first look. My mind might change by the time we get to this video. Uh, because of that unarmored defense and that little bit of extra hit points that we get. Because that unarmored defense would allow us to wear clothing, which would be important the further, the further we go down the line, if we wanted to use clothing, which, if my mind serves me correctly and I remember what I think I do, we are going to want that unarmored defense. So we've chosen Draconic Bloodline for that unarmored defense. We also are going to get a free extra spell as well. Again, I would probably just pick an ancestry that would give you something utility-based, not anything really offensive, because again, we're going more for an Eldritch Blaster here. And unfortunately, the other high-level features of uh, which would the highest we would get would be level six, isn't really gonna work for us. So if you, I mean, you could get the resistance, but eh, I mean, it's not really worth it. So we're not really focusing on mainly the subclass features for now, but we definitely want that unarmored defense 100%. So now we have our sorcerer subclass, meaning that we can go up to level two, grabbing sorcery points to be able to get distance spell, uh, allowing us to cast from super far away. Great, now we are also a sniper. Then at the third level, we also gain some other stuff. Heightened spell, targets that the spells that require saving throws have disadvantage. Not really relevant for this. Subtle spell, you can cast spells while silent. Very, very good. Would probably be good if we wanted to go for maybe a mat, like a caster shutdown route. Uh, but quicken spell kind of speaks to me. Because this means you can Eldritch Blast, fire off your beams, and then Eldritch Blast again for the cost of three sorcery points. Yes. But again, because we're recovering four sorcery points every short rest, you can basically go for an opening Nova round of damage with Quicken Spell as well. So suddenly this build just got jacked up even further. Pretty good. In addition, we'd also get a bunch of level two spells, of which we already have a few. We'd get Misty Step from Warlock, as we can see here, because we go from the level two spell list. So I would say Misty Step and Mirror Image are good kind of like options for the Warlock list. And then if we wanted to go for something a little bit different, I would say take more utility options here. Because again, when your main damage dealer is a cantrip, being Eldritch Blast, you get way more freedom in what you get to take. I would say things like Invisibility, Hold Person, Enhance Ability, uh, maybe even, well, maybe not Scorching Ray. Again, Eldritch Blast is just going to be more powerful, I think, overall. Uh, yeah, see Invisibility, things like Detect Thoughts, even Darkness would be really good if you can cast it quite far. There's a lot of different options here just looking off the bat for utility. And again, I don't think people realize that, yes, obviously, Baldur's Gate 3 damage spells are awesome. You want to be able to do your big blasts and like your Scorching Rays and your Fireballs and all that. 
But when you actually go for the utility stuff and you actually play the game like from an exploration and in, like infiltration and you know roleplay standpoint, things like enlarge, reduce, enhance ability, hold person, invisibility, darkness, all those cool things, detect thoughts, they feel so good to have and so good to use. I seriously recommend like looking into utility spells and seeing how much they can do for you because it opens the game up way more than you would know. And then we'd move on to level four and I and again we just get some extra cantrips and our next feat and I think that would just be our first ability score improvement to bump up our charisma even higher and I think we would just try and take our charisma to the highest possible level we could get it to probably 20 uh which with the right sort of setup we absolutely could I mean I could see going to uh 17 charisma grabbing Ethel's boon to make that an 18 and then by this point which would be total level eight which eh, you'd get twenty, you'd have twenty charisma, which is pretty good, and it would also mean that you would have um a, basically as soon as you beat the Ethel fight fight in Act One, you have eighteen charisma, which is super solid for the whole game until this point. So already we have a powerful build, and we know a specific point in the game where that where that power is going to be you know augmented quite well. That being getting Ethel's boon. Uh, so that's what I would personally recommend there. So that's how that build starts to come together. Then at level 5 we're getting even more sorcery points and now we can cast some extra leveled spells such as Haste. Haste would be super super important for allowing us to get even more Eldritch Blast off. At this point we don't really have anything that requires our concentration to use so Haste is basically free and because we're so far away we're less likely to get hit with attacks meaning that our concentration saving throws are pretty safe. I mean, if you wanted to take Sorcerer as your first level to get proficiency in those saves, you could, but I feel like getting that Eldritch Blast stuff online as quick as you can is more important to me. So I would definitely say that with our strategy, haste should be pretty safe anyway. It would give us more movement speed to move away, a higher arm and class to not get hit, and be able to cast even more Eldritch Blasts. So haste, absolutely something we want here. As well as perhaps gaseous form or grout flight, allowing us to essentially be able to have even more options to escape and get away, and counter spell as well, meaning that we could counter any spells that are coming our way, I mean, it's in the name, and as such make it even easier to maintain our position. See, all of this comes together really, really nicely. Then finally, at level 6, we'd get our subclass feature. Again, not really too much going for us here, so we'll just move on. Then at level 7, we would have 7 sorcery points, which is a good amount. We'd have level 4 spell slots, which is awesome. And we'd also gain access to some level some, to some level 4 spells, including something that stands out to me immediately is greater invisibility, allowing us to snipe from stealth, giving us advantage, and our enemies wouldn't even know where to move towards us to get to us. Say maybe we found a way to get a decent uh, stealth score, perhaps really bumping up our decks. I don't know if I'd be willing to go maybe a level dip of rogue to get, um, you know, expertise in that, but you could if you wanted to. But I don't think greater invisibility is going to be the centerpiece of our strategy, especially when we'd be getting it at total level 11. So going for that rogue dip at level 12 just doesn't feel right. So I would probably just put this on and just pray that it works and you succeed the st stealth checks. Also, Dimension Door, another way of teleporting, including getting an ally somewhere that you want them to go. So you can kind of taxi people around. This could be useful in the later game, but you never really know. And then finally, at total level 12, we would get an extra feat. Eight total sorcery points, so we have an even number, which is quite nice. Level 4 spell slots overall. And for our final feat, maybe bump up your decks, maybe bump up your constitution. I don't know, perhaps there's another feat that I haven't thought of yet that would work well. We could look around, something like the Warcast Defeat to give you advantage on those concentration saving throws if you wanted to make sure you can absolutely maintain haste. Uh, there could be Sharpshooter, but no, that doesn't, that doesn't unfortunately doesn't work on ranged spells, so that doesn't really work for us. Uh, you could grab... I mean, there's not really anything that immediately speaks out to me here, so I'd probably just go for the Ability Score Improvement. Um, maybe lucky if you wanted to make sure you can absolutely get that important hit off. There are a few options here, but none of them really speak out to me, so I'd probably just put it into ability score improvements, especially this late in the game. Uh, we don't really want to build around something that we only get at level 12, <laughs> like me of the past. <laughs> so we have our Eldritch Blast, our main damage, a way of being able to shoot it from really far away and deal tons of damage, and also be able to recover our sorcery points to keep that strategy up. Perfect. We also have a bunch of different spells that will augment this strategy and keep us going even longer. So I feel like we've got the main sort of casting bit out of the way. We have our levels, so let's get into the items. 
Now, obviously, the most important thing you would get out of items, let's say, for example, would be some, we, we're going to want to be looking for crit critical reduction, right? Now, the biggest way, well, one thing we did miss um, with our critical reduction strategy would be to go um, maybe f three or four levels of fighter uh, to get improved critical, which actually, now that I'm saying that out loud, because we have a way of recording, of, of recovering our sorcery points, do we actually need to go to level eight of sorcerer? See, again, this is what I'm talking about. This is how the plan comes together. So let's actually look at, let's see, how far could we actually go in Sorcerer and still be viable? Let's see, so we, we'd obviously want to go to at least level 2 to get that meta magic. If we're level if we're a level 4 Warlock and we're getting that Sorcery Point Recovery, we definitely want that. I think we still want to get Haste at least. So we'd have to go to level 5, right? And again, since we're already going to have our Charisma at 20 by this point, if we go with the Ethel's Boon, Boon route, then we don't really need that extra... Ability score improvement. Because again, if we're a Sorcerer 4, right, and we're a, uh, so, sorry, a Sorcerer 5, a Warlock 4, we're a total level 9, that gives us three levels to play with. So if we wanted to go the Fighter route, uh, we could get, if we go to Classes and we go to Fighter, we could go for the Champion to give us an improved critical hit. The number you need to roll a critical hit while attacking is reduced by one. This effect can stack. Meaning that now between this and um, our our uh, Spell Sniper feat, we now have an eight, we have an 18 chance to roll a crit. So maybe the way I would level this then is if you care less about actually being able to snipe from far away and you care more about being able to land critical hits, you could go Warlock 4, Fighter 3, and then take the rest Sorcerer after that, getting that meta magic and all that stuff later on if you feel like it's not as necessary. So you know what? Maybe that's what we'll do. I mean, again, though, but then you'd only then you'd get haste at max level. So that's a huge, that's a big part of what makes this build strong that comes in way later. So you see what I mean when I say that there's a lot that goes into this. You kind of have to choose what you want to prioritize. So for the sake of this build, and I think the fact we're going to focus on more on being a spell sniper and just getting off those powerful one-shot type deals, maybe we'll save haste as an endgame thing, or maybe get it from an item. Aha! That's how we fix that problem. We find haste on an item, and I think those of you who have watched this channel for a while already know the item I'm talking about. So I'm thinking now, let's go for Warlock 4, Fighter 3, and then go the rest of the way, Sorcerer to level 5, to get those sorcery points that we are going to be recovering super, super easily. So this means that now I'm going to suddenly open up a... let's open up a notepad. You're not going to be able to see this because I am, uh, this is probably going to look a bit weird on the recording, but because I am just, um, yeah. So I have a big notepad on my desktop that is just like all of the build requests and build plans that I have. So let's make this the spell, uh, the sniper, uh, the Avernus sniper. That's the title. And we are going to be a, uh, great old one warlock for, great old one. So a goo warlock. Goo Warlock 4. I'm sorry, the typing sound is probably either triggering ASMR in a good way or a bad way. <laughs> Goo Warlock 4, uh, Champion Fighter 3, and a, let's say, uh, we'll say Draconic. Uh, Draconic, Sork. Five. Perfect. We have a we have our levels now. We have our levels and exactly what we want to do. And already at that point, we're going to be getting pretty decent criticals. So we want to look into our items now, as I said. Um, so luckily for us, the good folks over on the Baldur's Gate 3 wiki have a page, I believe, critical hit threshold reduction. Perfect. Again, this is such an amazing resource because it's going to tell us everything we want to know right off the bat. So let's have a look at what we're going to be able to grab to reduce our uh, critical hit chance. Uh, reduce our critical hit chance, increase our critical hit chance. I misspoke. So, immediately we've got a few things that I can see here. Uh, the Knife of the Undermounting King comes to mind, but unfortunately this doesn't really stack. This just makes it so uh, you score a crit critical hit when rolling a 19. I don't believe this stacks with other features because it doesn't specifically state it does, but I could be wrong. Perhaps this lowers the threshold and now our critical hits come on a 17. I don't know. But because I'm not sure and we still have to test, I'll put it on the back burner for now. Uh, so let's keep looking. 
So we have a few options that I know will work right off the bat. First off is, let's see, we have the Covert Cowl, Dark Justicia Helmet, and Savarok's Horned Helmet. So three uh, head headpieces that will work for us. So let's have a look. First of all is the Covert Cowl, obtained in Act 2. As we can see, it's from Last Light In, which is an Act 2 location, and it means while obscured, the number you need to roll the critical hit is reduced by 1. Well, this might work out for us. We can get into an obscured spot and then fire from there. This is a good Act 2 option to get you started. But then I feel like one, or maybe even the Dark Justicia Helm would actually be better. You can get this in the Gauntlet of Shah, which is also Act 2, so either of these are going to work based on your preference pretty good. But then when you get into Act 3, we have Savarok's Horned Helmet, which you get from beating a boss in Act 3. And this this has an unconditional crit, redu crit reduction. So, and it also means you can't be frightened, which is nice. You get a bunch of other benefits. So I would say this is the thing we want to go for. So I would build with this item in mind, but show off the other two options for earlier on in the game for the sake of a video. So we will take Savrock's Horned Helmet as part of our equipment. I will copy that into my document and just so I don't forget. There we go. And also the Dark Justicia Helm and the Covert Cowl also work. So what else can we look at here? Well, there's a cloak, the Shade Slayer cloak. This is obtained in Act 3, we can see because it's from the Lower City Sewers, and while hiding, the number you need to roll the critical hits reduced by 1, so we'd get a high chance to crit on our opening round. Very good. Since it's a cloak, it's not necessary to the overall effectiveness of the build armor-wise, so it's not too bad that we get it in Act 3, so there's no point not putting it in. So, we'll take it. And then we have weapons here, which I can see, but I know for a fact that other than the Knife of the Undermountain King, which again, I'm not sure if it works, the Deadshot, the Bloodthirst, and the Duelist Prerogative all are obtained in Act 3 and are pretty late into it. Uh, yeah, and unfortunately it looks like the Duelist Prerogative might have the same issue as the Knife of the Undermounting King. So I would rule that out. The Bloodthirst, which <laughs> lets you cast True Strike. I mean, I knew this existed when I made the video, but I didn't want to say, hey, in order to make True Strike good, you have to play all of the game first. <laughs> Um, but basically what this will do is the number you need to roll a critical hit was reducing by what is reduced by one. This effect can stack. I mean, we might as well put this into our build for consideration. Unfortunately, it's not really going to let us um, get this kind of powerful feature early on, but it's worth pointing out. Also, we have the dead shot. This is a bow that is obtained in Act 3, which can uh, improve, reduce our critical hit chance again, so we want to pick this up. Now, you may think, oh, I must be going crazy here because I thought these only applied with the with the weapon attacks. Uh, so basically, Blood First would reduce the crit chance on Blood First. The Deadshot would, would, would reduce the crit chance on the Deadshot. No, this all stacks together for any attack. A lot of... Uh, equipment in Baldur's Gate 3, when it says, oh, you gain, like, perhaps advantage on attack rolls in the case of the Punch Strong Bastard, it doesn't mean just with the weapon, it means all of your attacks. So these do all stack together as far as I understand, but again, we'll have to test it. That's the point. Um, so, and then we can keep going here. There's a little bit more. We can grab the Elixir of Viciousness if you wanted to play with Alchemy. Uh, this can be crafted via Alchemy, and I'm not sure of the exact formula, but this could also help if you wanted to go that route. Uh, and then we also have Guaranteed Critical Hits. So we could go for something like Hold Person or Hold Monster, like with the Far Realms, which is a, um, a lifted ability, which would allow you to guarantee a crit once per long rest, the Killer Sweetheart, which would allow you to guarantee a crit once per long rest, and so there's a few other ways here, but I'm not going to focus on temporary conditions here, I want to focus on a solid overall thing. So with our improved critical uh, from Champion, Spell Sniper, and our Savrox Horned Helmet, and perhaps even the Deadshot, that is a six. We roll. We now roll crits on a sixteen with the blood first. That's a fifteen. That means we're going to be critting pretty much all the time if we can roll with advantage. So let's look at the items now, and I can think of one thing that is going to give us advantage right off the bat. If we go to the very rare section, where is it? The no, no, no. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Risky ring. So with the Risky Ring, you grant advantage on attack rolls, but receive a disadvantage on saving throws. And this can be obtained in Act 2, meaning this can come online quite soon as well. Meaning, now, if we're attacking with advantage on all of our uh, Eldritch Blasts, we now have an even higher chance to crit. So we've kind of built a big combo here. Uh, and I would say we could probably 
see if the Knight for the Undermountain King works in our testing, which we will get to later. So now that we have all of this figured out, we have our levels, we have our main items that we're going to want to grab. I know I did say that we could grab haste from an item, and that would be the Darkfire Shortbow, which you could throw on until you get the dead shot. So we could throw that on into the build as well. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other things we can do here. So now we can figure out that we have the headwear, we have our cloak. So now there's the amulet, footwear, handwear, and our armor. So... And we've kind of figured out our weapons as well, so we don't need to go for that. So let's have a look at clothing. Since we are a draconic uh, sorcerer, we can use clothing instead of armor. And there's one that immediately comes to mind, and I'm sure you already saw this coming. It is the potent robe. This can be obtained in Act 2, meaning that your cantrips deal an additional bit of damage equal to your charisma modifier. Meaning now our, our charisma modifier is being applied to our Eldritch Blasts twice making them even more powerful we're also going to get temporary hit points and a bonus to our armor class super super powerful and as you can see from the little infographic here can look great so now we have our main piece of armor awesome let's pop that into our little document what's next then we have our weapons we have our armor we have all of our crit reducing stuff i've left the wiki entirely <laughs> Oh, do ignore me there. Uh, let's see. Baldur's Gate 3 wiki. Yep. And then, so, I guess the only thing left to do would be to figure out the handwear, the footwear, and our amulet, and a second ring. So, for the handwear, mm, I, I mean, there's nothing that really speaks to me right off the bat that comes to mind, so let's just have a little scroll through until I see something that might work. The Braces of Defense would give you a plus two bonus to your armor class, since we're not using a shield or wearing armor, although I should look at the shields. Uh, charm or frighten a creature to gain a D 1d4 bonus to attack rolls and saving throws with the Cerebral Citadel Gloves. I mean, if we're frightening a lot with our Mortal Reminder, that could work. Uh, what else? Uh, oh, the Crater Flesh Gloves. Whenever you score a critical hit, deal an additional 1d6 force damage. Yes, this is something we want. Unfortunately, it seems it only is obtainable in Act 3. But again, there's plenty of options leading up to that point, And we'd kind of get this around the same time we'd get things like the Horned Helmet and such. You kind of would have to play this build a bit like you definitely have to play the game as if you were crafting this build as you kind of got into act three but it would definitely work so we're going to throw that in here now we can move on to the footwear and i can't think of anything right off the bat that immediately stands out to me i mean you guys know my usual pick uh, but because we're going with an unarmored build here that just made me think we have to make sure that our all of our pieces are considered light armor which they're not because Savarok's Horned Helmet is not is a medium armor piece, if I am remembering correctly. And I mean, the Cerebral Citadel Gloves, or what is it? What did we go for in the end? The, um, I've already forgotten. That's how you know I'm good at this. Uh, hold on. Where is it gone? I've lost it. Yeah, there we go. So we know the Crater Flesh Gloves will work with our kind of unarmored defense type playstyle. And our footwear can also work if we go with, for example, the Disintegrating Nightwalkers, which I probably will. But let's quickly go back to our headwear. Let's go to Savarok's Horned Helmet, which if I am thinking about this correctly... Yes, it is a piece of medium armor, meaning now that our unarmored defense strategy is not going to work. So now we're in a bit of a pickle. Do we give up a piece of our critical hit chance? I think we do. And I think we can do that by going with the... Well, no, not even the Covert Cowl will work because, well, it's considered light armor. So it looks like our headpiece is going to have to change. So let's actually think about this for a minute. What can we do? I would say then we could go for the Birthright Hat instead. We'd still get this in Act 3, but it would give us a plus 2 to our Charisma, meaning our Charisma can now go up to 22, meaning our Eldritch Blast can do even more damage. So I think we need to replace Savarok's Horned Helmet with our um, with the Birthright Hat instead. Yes, we're losing one of our chances to crit. However, this video is going to be so long. However, we now have a bit more damage on it anyway. So, and plus with advantage, it's still like we're going to be doing crits on 16, so it's still going to be pretty good overall. But again, this is mainly an Act 3 build at this point, but that's kind of where you want this level of power anyway. And if you know what to do, you can get these items quite easily. So yeah, with that overall, I think we're going to 
I think we've done, I mean, we can go through the amulets if we want, but I don't think there's anything here that's really going to pertain to our playstyle that much, just off the top of my head. So it might be worth grabbing something like the Spell Crux Amulet. Because we're playing as a Warlock, we would be able to recover one of our Warlock spell slots, which means even more Sorcery Points or Warlock spells, and this can be obtained quite easily in Act 2. So we're going to go with the Spell Crux Amulet here for our Amulet. And then for our Rings, hmm, if we're concentrating on a spell, something like the Strange Conduit Ring would work pretty well. Uh, something like the... yeah. I mean, we could get a little bit of extra damage, so if we're concentrating on a spell like Haste or Hold Person, each of our Eldritch Blasts... Oh, wearer attacks doesn't work. See, that's why you need to read. Uh, maybe you could go with the Ring of Arcane Synergy, but again, we're not really weapon attacking, so it doesn't really make sense. Maybe the Ring of Free Action could work, or the Ring of Protection. There's a ton of different options here. Uh, maybe actually we'll go for the Killer Sweetheart. This is obtainable in Act 2, and after we kill an enemy, it means our next attack roll is guaranteed to be a crit, so it fits nicely here. Perfect. We have our levels and equipment set out. So now, there's only one thing left to do. We need to test the build. And how do we do that? Well, give me a second to cut to the next bit of footage, and I'll tell you. So next up is the second most important part of this whole build-making process, the mods. Uh, basically, because I run this on PC, I'm able to use a bunch of mods to be able to get all the items I need quickly. Essentially allowing me to pump out these videos as much as I can. But I mean, you saw how long just theory crafting a build took. That whole clip of me just trying to figure out exactly what I wanted that build to be and the equipment and all that took nearly an hour. So let's get the rest of this video done a bit quickly. So the mods are quite simple. We have uh, our first mod is the tutorial chest summoning. This allows you to have a spell that will allow you to summon the what everyone calls the tutorial chest. It is a chest that appears on the Nautiloid. Uh, next to where you get the slab to rescue Shadowheart from the machine. And as such, it's where a lot of modders put all their items. So somebody made a mod to allow you to summon that chest to be able to get those modded at items at any point. I also have basket equipment. This essentially gives you a bunch of modded clothing that you can get. Um, but I obviously wouldn't use those for, the, for, my, for my videos. However, it does give me access to a jar that has all of the dyes in the game. So if I wanted to go for a specific color of armor, I have unlimited access to that. Also, Basket Equipment Camp Clothing just turns all of the armor from this mod into Camp Clothing instead, but it's not necessary. All items. This puts a barrel with every single item in the game into the tutorial chest, which I can summon and then get those items. Unlimited dyeing to make sure all of those dyes from, from Basket Equipment are, um, you know, unlimited. I don't have to like keep resummoning the basket to be able to get uh, more dyes. And the respec spell. This say I used to in my older videos because I didn't even think to look for a mod like this, which was stupid. I used to go and get withers every single time I made a new character, which extended the video making process by a long shot. So it's just like, wait, somebody had to have made a respec spell, and they did. So this made it a lot easier to make builds. <laughs> so unfortunately, maybe that's why you haven't seen withers in some of my builds for a while because I've unfortunately ret I've retired our, our our skeleton grandpa with this build. I also use improved UI and mod fixer because that's just what you need for the rest of these. So yeah, those are the mods I use. Uh, I will provide links to these mods in the uh, description of this video if you want to try them out for yourself, as well as the Baldur's Gate 3 mod manager, which is what I use to manage all of these. Uh, it's super, super simple. Just follow the instructions you can find online and you can get set up real quick. Now, let's get into the actual game. And here we are actually in game. Now, as with all of my builds, I I test them on Tactician. So we're going to choose that on a new game in order to make this character. So the reason I make new profiles for each of my builds most of the time is just because usually that makes it a bit easier to kind of build the character right off the bat going for looks. Who am I? We'll find out. Uh, going for looks and like, you know, items and not getting like a, all my stuff confused because if I keep using the same profile for multiple builds, my inventory get clogged up and it's like, ah, I, I don't feel like sitting around and doing proper inventory management. So I just make a new character and that gives me full free customization over what this character is. Because while you can go for a, um, like a, like you can take an existing profile and redesign it, uh, it's a bit, tr it, it kind of is limiting because you can't change the uh, body type the gender or like the race so I just decide to um make a new character and yes I know there are mods out there that would change that but they're really buggy and can like crash the game and stuff so I just like to make a new character 
So for this character, let's see, we're just going to quickly design this here. Uh, for kind of a shadowy sniper type character that comes from Avernus itself, I like the idea of going with a tiefling. Now I've built a lot of female tieflings, so not, but not male tieflings. So let's go for a body type 2 male tiefling here. Where to next? Sure, we'll work with that. And we can just kind of pick a face, just kind of make something a bit different that I haven't really made before. Yeah, you know let's go with this face, just for the sake of it. And again, someone who's done a lot of work in the Hells is probably going to be a bit battle-scarred. And in fact, the fires of a furnace burn so hot that even a Tiefling's fire resistance aren't going to overcome them. So they're going to have a bit of a burn. But again, what kind of Tiefling are we going to go for, actually? Let's go back to the sub-race. We can go for Asmodeus, Mephistopheles, or Zariel. Zariel might be the most appropriate for a setup like this. Again, this is where people who are law nerds for this type of thing might want to get into this a bit more than myself. However, I just kind of make something that I think looks cool and get some cool stuff. I mean, we're going to get the former Tertia Cantrip out of this, which especially on Tactician is quite nice because this doesn't incur hostility like Friends does. So immediately off the bat, I quite like being a Zariel Tiefling. So let's go back to the edit appearance thing. Let's regain our kind of stuff. Perfect. Uh, as for the maturity, I do think this character would be a little bit older, so let's scale that up a bit, give us some wrinkles. Yeah, slightly older guy. And then we'll, we'll ignore that final option. And then maybe a face covering. I mean, I like the kind of general tattoo style we've got already, but something like this looks interesting, uh, he says. Oh, I kind of like getting like the runes and like the bow for like the sniper on the side and like the little tattoo on the neck. Yes, we're going with this one. Piercings? Well, maybe. Let's have a look. Ooh. Yeah, I like that, actually. Well, we'll go with barred rings. Uh, as for our eyes... Ooh, wait, maybe we can do something like what I did with the True Strike Builder. For a sniper, maybe, maybe like, instead of where, like, Karlak had her Infernal Engine, maybe we have some sort of, like, Infernal Eye that is good for sniping. So maybe we could even make it the True Strike kind of pur purplish-pinkish colour. Oh, look at that! Yeah, that works. Okay, see, this is where I get excited. I love the character creation process. Uh, let's go for makeup. Do we want makeup? Ah, we could have a little beauty spot. Maybe. I don't know. It's up to you. Now for the hair. Ooh, there's so many good options all the time. But I feel like this guy would actually be quite smart. So I kind of... Ooh, I kind of like that hairstyle, actually. You know what? For the sake of time, we're going to go with a kind of a... That kind of hairstyle. Something that's well kept, but also a bit rascally. I quite like the black hair on it, but I think for the highlights, we might go with something a bit more fiery. Yeah, I like that. Uh, we actually could go back to the skin color. I mean, I don't mind this skin color, but I do like something a bit darker. Ooh, that doesn't look too bad, but maybe we could go with something a bit more along the lines of Karlak and get something a bit more red. Nah, it's too dark. Oh, I don't mind that so much. Yeah, kind of like that dark... Oh, I like it. I, we're going to go with that one. And do we want a little bit of face scruff? Hmm, I kind of like that. Less so. Ooh, the little moustache. Oh, why do I... Why am I getting, like, French vibes? <laughs> I don't know why I just said French vibes. Oh, my God. But yeah, no, we'll go with that. And then finally, I wish we could have, like, the highlight color appear on the facial hair. That'd be cool. And then for the horns, hmm. You know what? I almost like the idea of him having his horns broken off in the conflict. And maybe kind of making them a bit more of an ashy black. Yeah. Oh, but then that kind of clashes with the tattoo a little bit. But maybe he got, like, a tattoo, like, around it to, like, show he's not hiding it. That actually looks kind of nice. But... Yeah, no, I like the idea that this guy has seen a lot of shit and actually got, like, his horns broken off in the war. Perhaps he broke them off himself so he could fit into tight spaces and hide better so that he could be a more efficient, stealthy sniper. You know what? I like that. Guess what? We have our character. Well, from an appearance and lore standpoint. Now, as for our class, we already decided Warlock, so that works perfectly fine for us. We get a nice little outfit. We decided our cantrips already, so let's grab those. We decided our subclass already, great old one, and the background. Obviously we're going soldier, right? Because that's the whole thing we've kind of gone for here, giving us athletics and intimidation. However, if we wanted to be a stealth character, maybe something that gives us stealth would be better. So 
urchin or criminal? Urchin, after surviving a peak and bleak and poor childhood, you know how to make the most out of very little, using your street smarts bolsters your spirit for the journey ahead. Maybe instead, for, we'll go with the urchin background, but instead of a poor and bleak childhood, we'll just say, he, after escaping Avernus, similar to Karlak, he kind of had to live off, live off like, you know, scraps and like had a hard time making a living for himself because he's gone from being a war, a war soldier into like a regular citizen and Jesus Christ, that's a, hitting a little bit too hard for home in real life. Ah, well, okay, I mean, this character has a lot of depth all of a sudden. And now our ability scores, let's clear this. I've already decided our charisma is going to be 17 for Apple's Boon, then an ability score improvement, so we can have it at 18, 20 pretty early on, which is nice. Um. Oh no, but did I mess that up? No, I didn't, because we're going to be getting that extra feat from Sorcerer. Never mind, ignore me. Um... And then I guess obviously we just go for the standard stats. I would say perhaps a 16 in constitution would be more appropriate for high AC. And probably a 14 in constitution so that we have um, a decent hit point pool. Uh, but since we're going to be a far away battle control sniper character, we don't need our health as much. And then our last little bit of points can go into whatever. I'll probably pump them into either wisdom or intelligence. I would say probably wisdom just because those saving friends can be a bit gnarly. So yeah, I feel like we've got a decent stat spread overall. And we've got our sleight of hand and stealth. And so we can grab a couple of other things. I quite like deception here. And mm, perhaps we'll just go for intimidation just because that plays into our um, conversation side of things. And we already have decent performance and persuasion. So that works. All right, we have our character. Let's get into the next part. Oh, what do we name this guy? I usually just name these like the build title, uh, so we'll just call this dude Sniper. Cyper. I missed it. Fuck it, we're keeping it. And I usually just randomize this until I get something funny. Something funny. Something funny. Perfect. Let's get this. And we'll sit for a loading screen now. And this game likes to sit at 100%. And there we are, we are in the game. So now we can officially begin testing. First thing I do is run up here and grab the basket full of equipment. Scroll down and grab the die base. We now have our dies. Then I now go over here just because I'm kind of out of the way of most of the noise. And then we summon the tutorial chest. Activate. Uh, activate uh, turn-based mode because this chest only lasts for a few, like five turns and here we are in the equipment section so now we have our barrel full of all the items in the game so let's get into what we need so we're obviously going to want the blade of first blood is that what? that's not what it's called so this is the one thing about this. I think uh, this mod uses like the early access versions of some names for items. They are functionally the same, but uh, yeah. So we're going to get the Blade of First Blood, which is going to give us our increased chance to crit. Uh, we're going to also grab, where is the Dead Shot Bow? I'll also grab the Dark Fire Shot Bow as well. These are all in alphabetical order, so if I just read, I should find it. Uh, here is the Dark Fire Shot Bow. Oh, but it's the Dead Shot, so it'll be closer to the bottom. Yep, the dead shot. Perfect. There are our weapon options. And then, I mean, because we're wielding attack, we might as well grab another light weapon, I guess. I'll just do this really quickly. Uh, the Arcane Absorption Dagger, which would restore our first level spell slot, sure. Oh, I didn't mean to equip it like that, but hey, we're fine. Uh, let's keep going until we get to our headpiece, and we already decided this was going to be the birthright hat, so we'll grab that. As for our armor, we already decided this is going to be the Potent Robe, so we grab that. Our cloak is going to be the Shade Slayer Cloak, so we grab that. Uh, we didn't decide on the shield in the end. Uh, our rings, we decided on the, uh, where is it, the Killer Sweetheart. Killer Sweetheart, Killer Sweetheart, where are you, my Killer Sweetheart? There you are. And the other one was the Ring of, uh, Risky Ring, the Risky Ring, Risky Ring, Risky Ring, where are you? There we go. Perfect. There we go. Our uh, items there. And for the boots, I think we just decided on the Disintegrating Nightwalkers in the end for that extra maneuverability. And the gloves we decided on are, what were they called? Hold on. This is where I need to check my notes. This is why I copied it all down. Are the Crater Flesh Gloves, they are called. The Crater Flesh Gloves. Here we are. Giving us an extra bit of force damage on our crits. Nice. So there we have those. And then our amulet was the Spellcrux amulet. 
which is here. Perfect. We have everything we need. We could also grab a bit of camp clothing here if we wanted. Oh my goodness. We'll see how this looks all together first. But I might just grab something that might look decent. Well, you know what I want. Where is it? There we go. The Rakish Midnight outfit, right? There we go. We have all of our stuff now that we need. So we can end turn-based mode and equip it. So let's equip these two together. So now we have a uh, our reduced crit chance. Birth rate hat. Oh, oh potent robe. Great flash gloves, disintegrating that walkers, boom, bang, bosh, bam, boom. So there we have it. We have all of our items that we want. So, and then obviously I would get into the whole dying aspect here. So I would say we're probably just going to go for a Harlequin black and white look. Probably hide the headpiece. And then we'll say, let's grab the potent robe. Eh, I don't know. That's one of the problems you get with these builds is like, Fashion-wise, it can be a bit tricky. But let's see here how we feel about that. Ah, with the cloak as well. It's a, mm, I can't say I like the way this build looks fashion-wise. So I think we're going to swap over to camp clothing here. That looks a bit better. Almost like you're kind of like a stealth dude a bit. I, I can see that working. So we'll keep that on for now. So with that, we now have our armor and equipment. I will do a quick save so I don't have to do that again in case I need to go back and redo things. So now the thing is we're at level one. Now, not listed in the mod manager was another mod I used called 1xp to level. It doesn't use the mod manager, it's just a file that you place in the game folder and the game reads it and says, oh, for some reason, it only takes 1xp to level up, which means if we go all the way over here, skip all this dialogue now you'll see what's going to happen here if we just go up and i'll just blast it does six damage amazing and then boom we leveled up so let's actually see because we got a crit there uh offhand attack on imp it was in for it doesn't actually why is it not offhand attack melee it doesn't actually say what we rolled unless i'm stupid so this is where i have a bit of trouble i'm not great at this <laughs> how does it tell me how do i get it to tell me what i need to know oh well we'll figure it out later um but yeah so we as you can see we leveled up quite a few times just from that one enemy kill kill this guy and we're already level 12 awesome stuff quickly finish off this last enemy there you go look at that damage and as you can see we are getting uh, yeah armor class 7 attack roll 19 critical yeah ah so that's how you see so what was this one attack roll 19 critical attack roll 19 critical yep 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 so there we go we're critting on a 19 at least so we so here from here on out i separate lazel from the party because we no longer need her Quickly heal up at the safe fix just in case. And now we're going to level up. So I'm going to do this really quickly, not exactly go over everything, but now we can level up straight to 12, grabbing the things we talked about. So Armor of Agathis or Hellish Rebuke here. I'll go Hellish Rebuke, Agonizing Blast and Repelling Blast. And then there we go. I just realized I never set the spells at level one. So we have Harshers. I'll probably replace that with... Uh, armor of Agathis, and then we can also grab our uh, Misty Step, which we wanted, our Pact Boon, which... Oh no, because we're not... Yeah, because we are going to level 3. So I would probably... I mean, it really doesn't matter. If you want to make it so you're... I would probably just go Pact of the... Ch I would go Pact of the Chain, just to send out your little um, dude uh, to be able to grant you advantage because they threaten enemies. So that could probably work. Get an Imp for a Quasit. We're also going to get a uh, Searing Smite, which is... Eh. But yeah, oh, we are going to get Branding Smite though, which could be useful. Next up at level 4 of Warlock, we're going to be getting our feet, like we said. Are oh, we going to get an extra cantrip? Oh, grab. True strike. <laughs> Just for the sake of memes. And again, we can grab whatever we kind of like here. I mean, Phantasmal Force might be good. 
But like I said, you might want to take utility spells. So again, I'm going to just go for mirror image. We're going to try and make this as quick as we can. And here we are. We're going to get our main feature here, the spell sniper, like we said, allowing us to get a uh, free cantrip. And fireball might be good just on the off chance we're up against something that is resistant to force damage. I feel like if you're up against something that's resistant to force, it's probably going to be resistant to fire as well. I don't know. I'm just going to grab fireball again, keeping it simple. And then we leave Warlock and go over to Fighter. Grabbing a Fighting Style. Now, again, because we're mainly an Eldritch Blast dude, we don't really need any of these. So we might as well just take defense for the bonus armor class. Fighter is also going to give us Action Surge, which I didn't even consider, meaning we get an even bigger Nova Round. And then Fighter level 3 is going to give us our Champion, which we want, meaning that we now have an even higher chance to crit. Then we're going to keep going into Sorcerer to grab uh, some utility options for our cantrips. So I'll just take what the game has given us. We definitely want the shield and probably magic missile, like I said. And of course, Draconic Bloodline for that unarmored defense. But I would say, hmm, I don't really know what I'm going to go for here. Let's just grab something that has a powerful utility option. Silver, cold, perfect. And then I'm going to remove the scales because I don't really like them here. Right, next up we have our extra spells. Uh, duh, 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 duh. I'm going to say Enhanced Sleep. That's going to let us move around. Uh, and then we're also going to get to choose our meta magic. Obviously, we want Distance Spell here. And then, I don't know, Twin Spell doesn't really work for our strategy. Extended Spell doesn't either. Careful Spell? Nah, we'll go with Twin Spell just in case we do end up twinning haste because that's kind of what sorcerers do. And then for our next level of Sorcerer, we're going to get some extra spells. We already have Misty Stem and that. So let's grab some Utility Options right here. Oh, well, we only get to pick one anyway. Uh, careful spell. Oh, yeah, we wanted quicken spell, didn't we? God, we're going to be able to action surge and then quicken spell. Jesus. We get our feet here, allowing us to bump our ability score improvement. Again, we would have an 18 well before this point, thanks to Ethel's Boon. So now we're at 20 at level 10 or 11 even. So overall, that's that's pretty okay. Uh, da -da 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 -da, Blade Ward. Spells. Again, we get a level 2 one at this point. Let's just go for Enhanced Ability, because that would probably be useful in all those situations. And then finally, finally Sorcerer, level, Sorcerer level 5, which means we're going to be grabbing our Haste that we wanted here. Perfect. And go away, Lazel. And there we go. Now our build is complete and ready for testing. We have a lot of options to play with here, as well as quite a few here. Again, a lot of my builds probably require you to organize your hotbar a bit. We've, we've got everything we kind of want here. And there we go. Cyper. That's funny. Uh, anyways, and we also have our Executioner ready to go from our last fight. So let's rock and roll up to the testing area, as it were. As you know, I most of my combat showcases are against the tutorial boss, Commander Zake, I believe his name is. And as such, that is not going to change here. So let's run on up to him and get into it. Um, it's going to waddle on over. I'm showing the full process here. I want you to know, like, I've, I've done this walk so many times. I've been recording this whole time, yes? Good. <laughs> okay. Woohoo! Wipe the fur of the brow there. Right. Then we skip the opening cutscene that I've seen 50 million times at this point. And let's get to work. So immediately right off the bat, we can start our combat round by going Eldritch Blast 1, 2, 3. Two of those were crits! Look at that damage. Let's have a look. Yep, attack roll 17, critical. It works. The build works, baby. Let's go. Now we're going to quicken spell and absolutely unload on this chav. Let's do it. And we also get advantage because of the risky ring. Let's... Boom, shakalaka, and he's frightened, Which, but that's not all. We are going to action surge. And because our build is all about going the distance, like we said, we are going to... Look at that range. That is the whole room. Holy shit. And then... Boom, 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 boom. And... That's the build working, my friends. God damn. Most of these were crits, I'm pretty sure. That one was a 15. 16 crit. Holy hell, look at all these crits. <laughs> 
Oh, my days. See, this is strong. This is a strong build. And then look. We're going to wander over here. Keeping a decent distance. And guess what? We're going to do it again. He's dead. And then we can... Because now we're kind of close to an enemy that we don't want to be close to. We can just misty step away. And then that is all we can do for that round. He's going to dash at us. And then, again, because he's close to us, we just misty step away. Using our bonus action. That's used up our warlock spell slots, but that is fine. We are out of... We are going to be out of sorcery points, but again, at this point, we can, like, do a short rest and then recover those. So let's just quickly... But again, then, we don't need it, because we're actually in a decent range. Boom. More crits. I think that shows off the build well enough, so let's move on. And with that, as soon as we leave the Nautiloid, finish that little cutscene, and then are landing on the beach, we can immediately go to camp, and I start actually making the video from this point. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I guess as I always say in my videos, that is the build. Uh, we have our equipment already that... As you can see, it went absolutely crazy. That build was getting crits left, right, and center, and was super, super fun. You have the ability to snipe from really far range. Uh, again, it doesn't necessarily show off all the situations where that could work, but imagine something like a fight where you have a bunch of enemies trying to funnel through a doorway or a small opening, maybe in like a cave or something. You were just Eldritch blasting them back through, back through, back through. Maybe you have a number, another member of your party who's cast... Um, some sort of like trap like in web or hunger of hadar or something or maybe standing in the doorway with spirit guardians like you can really really funnel your opponents in and of course again we've come up with a character that has a powerful build uh an interesting combo uh lots of damage and also you know has an interesting character backstory to him and uh, yeah that's how that's how i make a character for Baldur's gate 3 pretty pretty simple overall again the big caveat with this build being the fact that a lot of this equipment is obtained later in the game this is i believe act three because it's to create a flesh gloves i believe that's from the um i believe that did we read did i actually read where that came from hold on this is again none of this is scripted Creator. how do you spell that am i done you know script. I'm not going to worry about it right now. But a lot of this equipment is obtained a little bit later on in the game. Some of our stuff is obtained only in Act 3, which kind of sucks. And again, we weren't technically weren't even at full power there because we don't have Ethel's Boon yet. Uh, so, and then obviously things like this and this really, really helped out. So, and again, we know that these are obtained in Act 3. So you can kind of supplement that with things like the Covert Cowl in Act 2 and all that sort of thing. So I would, so I would in the video, I would have the Covert Cowl or the... Um, dark executioner helmet here to kind of show off but then again we had to adjust all of that because of our unarmored defense type deal which again we have a decent amount of ac here but we don't need a huge amount because again we're a sniper we're staying far away that's the whole point but overall yeah i think this is a pretty fun build you would definitely get a lot out of this i think throughout the game like you are still going to be a powerful eldritch blaster it's when you get to act three or kind of act two Act 3 kind of range is where this build is going to absolutely take off to the stratosphere. You're going to be getting those crits all the goddamn time, and you're going to have a ton of fun. But you also have a ton of utility for getting around the map, like I said, like Featherfall, Mage Hand, uh, Misty Step, uh, Fine Familiar even, uh, a uh, whole bunch of different things, Haste, Enhanced Sleep, all that stuff. And as you can tell, I've gone into YouTuber mode. I was starting to record this like it's an actual video, and it's not really. Now, this video is already super long. We must have clocked in over an hour at this point easily. So I've already made like a fucking movie. Um, so why? And I know I said I was like, ah, maybe I won't do the um, cut content showcase. But you know what? I'm going to do the cut content showcase because we're already in it this deep. Let's actually get into it. It's going to take me a while to grab all the stuff that I want to show off. So I'm going to cut the video here and I'll be back in a minute. All right, I'm back, and here we are at the cut content portion of the video. So basically, these are I have a list of items here. You can see them all lined up in a row. I just pointed at my screen as if you can see it. My God. Um, <laughs> but these are all of the items that I would have liked to have used in builds, but I didn't because obviously they are content that you can only acquire through mods. But like I say, I'm going to provide some kind of insight into what I might have used them for if I would allow myself. First up, we have the uh, the Scarab of Protection. This is a legendary talisman. Spell protection gives you advantage on saving throws against spells. I mean, pair that with the Risky Ring. I mean, damn. 
Also, Necromantic Evasion. When you fail with a saving throw against Necromancy spells or spells cast by undead foes, you can use your reaction to succeed instead. Basically, it's an undead destroyer, but just that constant advantage on saving throws is awesome. It's also the only legendary amulet. So it has a little bit, of, and it also has a unique icon and everything. I know Larian said they aren't planning DLC, but they must be. There's so much cut content hidden in this game that I think would be awesome to expand upon. Like, I feel like this, or perhaps this may have been, you know how um, the Dijin, the Jin in um, Act 3, the one who has the wheel at the circus, sends you to that jungle? I was, I think he may have also originally have been meant to send you to maybe like an Egypt-inspired place, like some somewhere with a big desert, where you would have picked this up. But I'm not entirely sure, I can't confirm that, but that's just my theory. Okay, no, I'm not saying that. Um, <laughs> I just yelled a gay at the top of my lungs. <laughs> oh, my window's open. <laughs> Uh, for the person who commented saying they wanted bloopers, there you go. Um, magical Hand Crossbow. This is another plus two crossbow. When you shoot a target at close range, you can make an additional melee attack against it as a reaction. Are you kidding me? Why is this not in the game, Larian? This hurts. My first ever build on this channel was the Dante build, and I would have loved to have used this. This could be... Oh, this would have been so cool for so many builds, but unfortunately it doesn't work. But again, something like a Devil May Cry build or like a maybe even like maybe like a cyberpunk build or something like from like cyberpunk edge runners or whatever. Something really cool that could be made with this here or maybe like just any kind of like gun character. Hell, my Vosh build would have loved this. Oh, it's so annoying. I think the reason why it was cut, though, is because the additional melee attack. I mean... It probably would get a bit glitchy, because I guess it would kind of have to require... It would use your whatever you have equipped as a melee weapon for a extra attack. Which, again, maybe if you have something equipped that's a bit funky, maybe if you don't have anything equipped, maybe it gets a little bit weird. I don't know, but I'm not going to test it just in case my game crashes or something. <laughs> Next up is the Arduous Flame Blade. It's a plus one longsword, uh, but it has a unique attack. Uh, it's called the um, Flaming Blade. Immolate your blade like a phoenix wing and strike a foe with its blazing steel. The wielder adds a proficiency bonus to the damage. Really, really nice little piece of kit here. It looks, it looks cool. I mean, it looks just like a... Uh... I don't think I can equip it. Can I equip it, please? Yeah, it just looks like a longsword. But again, that bonus attack. I wonder if I can actually show it off. Hang on. Yeah, look at this. You basically get Searing Smite. That's... Oh, see, that's awesome. See, I'd love that. I would have loved that for my um my Nero build. Absolutely. That would have been sick. Uh, in fact, you know what? Maybe I could show off some other stuff. I don't know. Uh, the Rebound Battle Axe. This is another cool one because this is what I would use for a Kratos build. This blade's magical power only functions if it's bound to an Eldritch Knight or, or a, is a Warlock's Pact weapon. This weapon has a plus one bonus to attack uh, to its attack rolls on the wrist. This weapon has the Throne property and deals an additional wonderful thunder damage when thrown. So if you went with an Eldritch Knight here, you all of a sudden have Kratos' Throwing Axe dealing extra damage and it has the Throne property, which will make it really powerful for like a Berserker Barbarian uh, throwing build, a bit similar to my um, throwing dagger build that I made, but I could also throw in something like, you know, dual wielding to get like the Blades of Chaos and like some cool armor and such to really make Kratos. This is what I would use, but unfortunately it's not in the game and that hurts. That hurts a lot. It even looks, it even kind of looks like Kratos' battle. Like, ah, see, with the pommel and that, see, it would have been perfect. Would have been perfect. But we don't get to use it. Next up, the Headband of Intellect. Yes, there is an upgraded version beyond the Warped Headband of Intellect. I think Larian must have originally intended for you to be able to repair the Warped Headband, perhaps some point in Act 3, and set your intelligence to 19. That's insane for a headpiece. Yeah, see, it even works. It, it's fully functional within the game, you're just not allowed to use it. Boo. Come on, Larian. Next up, in a similar fashion to the um, Rebound Axe, is the Shield of Returning. This just gets Bound Weapon, meaning you now have a shield, if I pull it out, that you can just throw and it will come back to you. Let's give it a yeet. See ya. And then boom. Captain America build. Hello. Uh, perhaps Berserker Barbarian, Open Hand Monk, go crazy. Like... It would be so cool, but again, we can't use it. You don't even need the Eldritch Knight levels. It just comes back to you. Ah, oh, the fact that this isn't in the game is such a shame. Like, don't get me wrong. It's not like a thrown weapon or anything, so it's not going to do a ton of damage. It's just going to do, like, item damage that you just get for throwing, like, regular stuff. But it's still really cool, and it gives you a buff to your armor class. 
Maybe that was the problem. Maybe it was the fact that, um, you know, you had to, it, it's kind of like make your armor class move up and down and perhaps that caused some problems, but oh, it's, it just sucks that we don't get to use it. And the final one is the gargoyle boots. Essentially, it's just a decent looking pair of boots. Yeah, it's actually a really nice looking pair of boots that would give you the ability to cast um, stone skin or not, or actually a unique version of it called gargoyle's countenance giving you resistance to non-magical bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage, just making you extra tanky. It also turns you into Sandman. Sorry, I just got done playing Spider-Man. Great game. Uh, so yeah, uh, that is kind of like the game's cut content, I guess. I mean, I wanted to show it off because, you know, I mean, if I allowed myself to use mods, modded subclasses, modded items, whatever, Obviously, the build ideas and the prospects for certain builds could go absolutely wild. My only problem with this is, there's a couple of problems I have. I've already stated the fact that if I do this, it isolates console players, which I do not want to do. I don't think that's fair on other on those guys. And I'm, I'm pretty sure a fair amount of my uh, viewer base is console players, so I don't want to isolate them. And I feel like it's fair that I keep these builds as vanilla as possible. Second off... Using modded subclasses and then making a build off of those and just saying, look at this really cool thing I built with someone else's work, it's a bit shitty, in my personal opinion. No shade to people who do use modded builds and, or, or make videos based on modded builds. Uh, maybe, like, just gameplay videos of them are fine, like, just showing them in action. That, I think, is amazing. But going and saying, like, oh, look, I made this super cool build, and even, like, if I credit them, it's like I'm taking credit for other people's creativity and technical expertise which i'm not personally okay with so that is my stance on that um the only mods i use are the ones to get the items so i can make these builds um but i think that's going to be it for me uh again super super long video again if you watched this entire thing uh i commend you because damn uh <laughs> That would have been a long and a tough one to listen to me talk for so long, but I think it gets the point across of, like, how much actually goes into these builds. Like, for those of you who aren't into the build-making scene for things like tabletop games and Baldur's Gate 3, you probably don't realise how much time and effort it takes to kind of do this. And I'm not saying I've got a hard shake of it. I mean, really, with these builds, like, like I've made an entire build and even done extra stuff in, what, under two hours? And then my editing is literally just slap it in DaVinci Resolve and cut out bits that I don't want, uh, add some text if there's if more clarity is needed, throw the combat footage at the end, bing bang bosh, it's done, upload. Uh, I don't go hard into the editing, but for people who do, I've seen, I don't watch a lot of build videos because I don't want to, you know, accidentally like, like basically get an idea into my head and then kind of rip off someone else. So, but the ones I have seen, like they put in really, really good effort into their editing and you can tell that they're super, super passionate about it. So I just want people to know that actually coming up with these builds is really, really, it can be tricky. It can be. I'm not saying, again, I'm not saying I've got a hard shake of it because I don't. I do this in the most easy way possible. Again, this video that you're seeing now has been minimal effort. So, but <laughs> I just feel like I wanted to kind of show off the whole build making process. A, so you know what goes on behind the scenes. And B, so that if you, if for some reason one day I stop which might happen because eventually i'm going to run out of ideas or just get bored so at that point what would be the point of continuing because i still only do this for fun and if i'm not having fun what's the point so in the off chance that i leave one day but you still want to make builds kind of in my style well then here you go this is how i do it it's not the most efficient way it's not the most clever way hell it's probably not even a very good way but it's my way and that's done me well enough to garner the little community that we have so i'll take it but yeah, I think that's going to do it for me. I don't mean to end that on such a somber note. My apologies. But um, uh, I hope you all enjoyed this video. Again, if you stuck through the whole thing, credit to you. You get a imaginary cookie. <laughs> all right. I will see you all next time. Thank you once again for a thousand subscribers. Or like 1700, which is more like what it's at now. Jeez. I was very late to this.